Hello. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Pretty good. Can you hear me? Good, good. So you're in the airport at the moment. That's right. I'm in the airport launch, so I'm going to speak a little bit softer, um, assuming that you can still hear me, of course. Sure, I can hear you really well. That's great. So that's great. Where are you going? Um, to New Zealand, actually, to Auckland. Oh, fantastic. And what are you doing there? Um, there's this annual uh, food camp there uh, called uh, the Bear Camp, uh, the B-A-B yeah. camp, or Kiwi Food, uh, and I'm attending it for the first time. Oh, fantastic. That sounds lovely. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you for taking the time while you're at the airport to speak to me. I really sure. appreciate it. Um, so, um, just for the setting the time frame, I have two and a half hours. Um, okay. I, I don't know whether that will be sufficient for you. Yeah, that's plenty of time. That's Don't worry. Fine. I think we'll be about half an hour probably, if that's okay. Sure, because there's like a lot of questions. Uh, so if you yes. want to <laughs> go through them all, I, I would estimate that like um, one hour um, of time would be. It could be. Yeah. It could be. Uh, it depends how much you have to say. But if you have to say a lot, I'm happy with that because uh, we just want to get as much information as we can. We're doing a big piece. It's uh, 1,500 words, so we want wow. lots of detail mm -hmm. if possible. Um, so yeah, should we begin? Yeah, I should. Yeah, go go ahead. Great. I'm recording, um, but my recorder is only doing the audio at the moment. Are you recording as well? Yeah, I'm doing a uh, screen recording of the video of both sides, and also a regular like um, recorder. Uh, so we have like three um, channels. So there will Great. be high quality audio and video that I will send you uh, right after the call. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, could you start with telling me a bit about your background? Uh, have you always been into programming? What was it like growing up for you in Taiwan? <laughs> well, uh, my ground background is pretty transparent. Um, I started programming uh, in 1989. Uh, that would be when I was eight years old. Um, it was around the time when the martial law was lifted in Taiwan. We had freedom of press uh, for the first time, and uh, my parents, both working in journalism, uh, started to slowly um, migrate to typing instead of writing uh, for, for their work. Um, but at the time, um, things like the IBM PC and so on are still considered work and not personal um, items, uh, but I was really interested, so um, I just started reading the books um, of programming when I was uh, around eight years old and started programming uh, without a computer at home, and so I just, you know, uh, draw the keyboards and write down the uh, responses that the computer would supposedly give me and so on. And it went on for quite some time before my parents finally gave in and gave me, um, you know, a personal computer. So how did you become interested in politics? Well, it, it's, it's massive, you know. Um, because when I was, was eight, as I mentioned, we just got uh, democracy and freedom of press. So, like, everybody was talking about politics. Like, we get to vote for the first time um, meaningfully. And um, it's like, uh, I remember um, the, around the dinner table um, in our home because my dad is a political uh, commentator uh, in the um, newspaper and my mom also covers uh, for politics when I was young. So there's like this constant debate um, about the speed we're taking toward democracy, uh, about what's the best form, whether it's button up, whether it needs a constitutional amendments, whether it's and things like that, and how this multi-party system actually work, and things like that. So, so I grew up uh, listening to those, uh, as is uh, the people in my generation. Very interesting. So tell me about the Sunflower Movement and how it changed things in Taiwan and kind of led you to where you are. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a like any large, massive scale movement, um, anyone's viewpoint would be radically different from anyone else uh, who participated. There's literally half a million different viewpoints. So, uh, what, what kind of um, experiences would you like to hear about those 22 days? Where were you when it was happening? What were you doing personally? Hmm. All right. Um, so I remember um, I was working with um, social text uh, in 
in the Silicon Valley as well as a consultant uh, for Apple at the time. And I remember um, posting um, in a social text um, chat channel, we call it Signals, that's our virtual workspace, saying that I really need to take a leave because democracy needs me. Uh, and, and so it's like one of the, the statements that really stuck because um, I, I really have to explain to my coworkers what, what's happening, why a bunch of people occupy the parliament. Um, and I remember going there at the night of the protest, um, bringing, um, you know, my laptop and my phone uh, for the, the covering of the, the event, uh, providing the necessary equipments for the civic uh, media there. And we all thought that it will end um, that night. I, I thought we all thought that it's just one night of demonstration. But I remember this young uh, person who lent me his laptop because we need this really stable connection between my Wi-Fi and through an Ethernet bridge um, to the um, person, the camera person who is um, taking in the, the footage of the protest outside of the parliament. And he was like, this is my administrator password. I think he was running Windows 7 uh, and saying, you know, you can have that laptop all night if you want. I'm like, okay, you look like a 20 something. How, how does a 20 something uh, is okay with parting with this expensive looking laptop? Um, and, <laughs> and like just leaving it to a complete stranger. Uh, for, for, for the entire night. Um, and little did I know that he belongs to the Black Island Youth, uh, the group who decided to break into the parliament and climb over walls and things like that. So laptop is going to be a burden, uh, <laughs> which is why he's <laughs> just safely depositing it in the media um, camp right outside the, the parliament. And so I think there's a really interesting meeting uh, between the, the free software people, um, the, my, my camp, uh, uh, and the people who are young activists and people who are civic media. Um, we did not work this closely uh, in any of those demonstrations before. There's plenty of demonstration like the anti-nuclear, uh, forced nuclear plan demonstration where we strictly speaking just provided broadband and things like that, but always in a very neutral way and kinds of, you know, we just support the media, we don't become the media. Uh, but, but the line becomes really blurred uh, between the, the media and the network people and the activists uh, during the days that followed because um, we had to improvise practically everything uh, because there was no internet connection to, to begin with and, and we had to bootstrap ourselves. Uh, and so, yeah, I remember in, um, in those 350 meters ethernet cable <laughs> to, to connect uh, through the, the parliament building to the street outside. I remember talking in our um, hackathon the F0 hackathon about whether it's a crazy idea to apply for a fiber optic line to a random place in a street's cross section. I, I don't think any of the telecoms got those requests before, but, but it is the place we, we needed to provide the Wi Fi for the um, people covering the protests on the street. And, and they actually consented and, and sent this uh, fiber optic line a couple of days later. And um, I remember. Um, um, you know, setting up those um, real-time um, spreadsheets uh, using a spreadsheet uh, that I co-wrote uh, with uh, Dan Brickling, the, the inventor of spreadsheets, called EtherCalc. Um, we were just beta testing uh, that free software um, um, spreadsheet, and then uh, people started just swarming uh, on that little um, post to paste in all the links they could find that is relevant uh, to the protest, including the maps, um, the charging stations, the uh, um, the OpenStreetMap people did a really comprehensive mapping of the resources and um, the pol police force and, and where to get supplies and things like that, as well as real-time social analytics of the sentiments across um, the, the island about all the major arguments of the protest, um, as well as, of course, like court re reporter style stenographic recording of uh, all the debates that's being held uh, in the occupied parliament, as well as in the streets nearby. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of memory 
countries uh, toward the end of the Occupy, there's uh, a bunch of people who don't want to retreat, um, and uh, they uh, appeal to us, saying that we want to use the system that you're using for decision-making, Lumio, um, to have a um, real consultation about whether to, to retreat or whether to continue um, occupying. Um, I also remember how we started using Lumio because we had this coordination problem um, of um, just random volunteers showing up to help with the connectivity and we had no idea whether they are um, actual civic hackers or engineers or whether they're just here for the fun um, and because the engineers have uh, you know a fast lane uh, toward all the um, occupy stations and so yeah maybe people just um, getting for the ride and we, we had to um, somehow till a network engineer from a non-network engineer and so we use Lumio to, to uh, crowdsource the ideas uh, of um, there's we started with some really bad ideas like um, you know depositing one's passport or electronic ID or, or yeah that we nobody mentioned blockchain at that point it wasn't um, that popular in 2014 uh, but um, yeah we, we settled out with something really really simple which is asking anyone who show up who looks new uh, what's uh, 2 to the power of 6 or 2 to the power of 9 uh, and if they can answer it they're likely a uh, civic or um, a internet engineer and, and things like that so, so there's um, literally um, Every day is a completely different um, topography, a completely different configuration that we need to, to work with. Um, I remember a day where the Supreme Court uh, did this interpretation of the law saying that it is uh, flash mobs are constitutional. They don't have to get a approval beforehand if the, it's, there's no coordinator and there is no um, organized, pre-mediated uh, will to, to gather. And suddenly we have random people showing up and holding iPads or, or wearing GoPros and, and saying they want to be volunteer um, civic journalists because, uh, well, now flash mobs are, are legal. Um, and, and so we had to coordinate those people. And so we, we printed, um, we've we made a website uh, where you get to upload your photo and type your name and uh, they print out this civic journalist patch uh, for you and uh, with a QR code and a succinct explanation of um, your rights after this uh, Supreme Court uh, judgment so just so that any police who didn't get a note uh, can just scan the QR code and understand uh, the civic journalists is now protected um, in the same way constitutionally as mainstream journalists. Um, so yeah, it's like 22 very different um, worlds um, day after day, but, but it, it's fun. Fantastic. It just sounds like it's very highly organized as well, which might be one of the reasons it works so well. Do you agree with that? Or? I wouldn't say it's, it's organized. Um, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's very tightly, um, I would say coordinated. Um, that, that would okay. be a better term. Um, there, there's no, there's no organization uh, per se. There's just protocols, um, because it's it's co-organized by at least a dozen, and by the end of it, at least two dozen NGOs um, and some not even organizations like Dev Zero, just a random bunch of people, um, and so each of them had to find the places where they provide some value uh, to to the other occupiers, uh, while um, you know agree on some way of uh, achieving a rapid, ra rough consensus so that we can go on to do our thing throughout the day and, and respond to the media and things like that. So there's this huge um, amount of using Hackpad, of using either Calc, of using all sorts of collaborative documents uh, to, to do um, synthetic um, documents, guidelines, and things like that. So it's very um, common for one side or one group or just one person and, uh, to to you know, put up something that they think is a viable plan for the day and um, on a hackpad, and then people would just swarm on it, and the discussion itself would be recorded and actually live streamed, and so uh, more people discover it and join the discussion. But, but magically, um, people just agree on something uh, by the end of the hour and things like that. But it's literally hundreds of people, um, and so yeah, I would say it is um, that the non-human 
agent. Uh, things like HAPE and either Calc are really providing the, the facilitation role in a, in a very um, agency wielding way. So, but I wouldn't say that those um, collaborative documents are organizers of the protest. It would sound very funny. Um, so, so, I would say it's coordinated. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Tell me about how you met Chia Lang and how you ended up working together. Because I've spoken to um, Nesta in the UK um, and they kind of described the situation where you met and you went back to the government. How did that work in real life? Uh, you, mean, you mean CEO, CEO Gao, Gao Jia Liang? Yeah, of course. Right. Um, I think I met CEO. I, I, I'm sure that we met um, like virtually uh, on, on some bulletin board systems, but that doesn't count, right? So um, we, I think we met face to face uh, when I recruited him uh, for a random Silicon Valley startup. Um, I, I think that was in um, early 2000 or yeah, or, or 1999, um, something like that. Uh, and um, so. Um, the, the idea, uh, yeah, it, it's 2000. Um, the idea is um, I, I worked it in my first startup um, as a CTO of a small company called Inforian. Um, and Inforian is kind of a, a prototype like, like we did the first um, online um, auction slide in, in Taiwan, a, a meta search client, a, a what we will now call the, the social media or the, a MySpace like or could like uh, thing, and like got some investment from Intel around the time that I quit. Um, and so it was one of the larger um, like internet companies back in 1996. Um, and so um, after I quit, uh, CEO Ga became the CTO of that company. Um, uh, and, and started doing um, the instant messenger uh, CICQ, which was really popular also. Um, and so, yeah, we were like alums uh, in the same startup company, but our times did not uh, overlap. Uh, but um, after the dot com crash, um, CEO also left uh, in Florida, and so um, we started planning well, what we were, were going to do next. Um, and so we thought that we could build a federated, not central. Um, social um, system would build on bulletin board systems, uh, which is, well, part free net, part diaspora. Now that we have words for it, it was really hard to explain uh, in the 2000s. Uh, and so we, we did a startup together, and, and that's how we met. Oh, great, great. And how did your relationship develop? Um, how did you uh, get involved together in the current Taiwan initiative? Well, see, it's, um, I think it's 2000. One or 2002, where we started those weekly meetups um, called uh, the Elixis uh, meetups. Um, and Elixis um, stands for the, the Elixir Project Nexus. Um, and the Elixir Project um, stands for um, mostly um, it's just a random bunch of people who um, are inspired by, by things like indie media or by things like um, the, the net times and, and you know those communities and want to build a similar community in, in Taiwan and so we did a lot of things we uh, translated this very important uh, software called movable type uh, and before movable type slash uh, and also published um, with O'Reilly Taiwan, quite a few books, and also translated the word blog and started this um, circle of bloggers who meet uh, regularly to, to talk about how we can decentralize uh, or re-decentralize journalism. Uh, and so it was, um, CO and I were both active participants um, in that circle, um, and we meet um, every week, uh, every Sunday at the Wisteria House, which was um, like the the mecca for, for the Taiwan activists working on democracy for the past 40 years or something. Uh, and so um, it, it, it's interesting. So um, yeah, we, we quickly gathered um, just random sorts of people uh, who I will now see as a prototype of the Gap Zero movement um, some 10 days, uh, 10 years uh, later. Um, and so um, that's how our relationship developed. And um, he taught me this programming language called Lisp, uh, and I taught him this. 
programming language called Perl, and then uh, together we did some software projects together. Uh, he did this decentralized uh, version control system called SVK, which was just like a predecessor to, to Git. Uh, and uh, I did this language called Perl 6, um, and, and things like that. So, so yeah, we, we just always uh, check each other's projects and collaborate it um, and just fill in whatever uh, things that the others promised, uh, perhaps when starting a project and sometimes me in the supporting roles and, and me in the supporting role. Um, and so it went on, I think, um, for years uh, and he went to uh, London, I think, to join for Tango, uh, and after I joined Social Text, I managed to convince him to join Social Text, uh, and so it was 2008 when I joined Social Text, and so he had this, this um, I'm sure that he told you, this par um, paragliding um, accident, um, and which was really the, the foundation of the Gulf Zero movement, because he was paralyzed in bed and couldn't really do anything other than try to, to organize people uh, and so so yeah and and that that was when this really ingenious uh, domain name was invented and I think it was really the, the missing piece uh, we, we tried to bootstrap communities like this for at least five times uh, before but but this domain name uh, g0v tw uh, I think is really crucial yeah fantastic great. So, you've been digital minister since 2016. Uh, you are the youngest ever uh, minister in, in the government, is that correct? Well, not, not quite. Um, so, um, I, I'm the, of course, I was the youngest when I joined, uh, but um, there was a minister who was younger than me. Um, Zheng Lijun, when, when she joined the cabinet many years ago for the first time uh, as the minister in charge of youth affairs, uh, she was, I think, a few months uh, younger than, than me when I joined the cabinet. Uh, I am the youngest minister with a portfolio, but, but that isn't saying much. Okay, <laughs> so you're one of the youngest we could... Yeah, well, you, you can say that I was youngest when I joined, but, or, or the youngest uh, minister with a portfolio, or the first digital minister, I don't really care. <laughs> I'm sorry? What's a typical day like for you now? There's no typical day. Um, so, I mean, um, I, my, my work is, is very structured around the, the days of the week. So there's a typical Monday, there's a typical Tuesday and so on, but, but there's no, no typical day per se. Um, so, yeah, which day of the week is your favorite? I have no idea. Friday. <laughs> okay. My typical Friday <laughs> is um, is having a multi-stakeholder um, forum or discussion uh, with the participant officers in, in the ministries. In every ministry, and it is part of a national regulation we uh, instated, um, is that um, <clears throat> every ministry must assign at least one person, <clears throat> but more often than not, like a team of people who work as POs or participation officers. And just like officers who talk with the parliament or officers who talk with the media, um, these people are there to talk with everybody, uh, with stakeholders. And so the PO network is um, one of our um, ways of trying to imbue uh, into the government this coordination without control. Uh, or leaderless um, framework that we've been prototyping for the past 20 years or so uh, outside of the government uh, in a national setting. And the way it works is, of course, uh, we use this free software system called Sandstorm um, that provides um, collaborative documents, um, spreadsheets, and Kanban boards, you name it chat rooms um, and get um, the people from every ministry uh, who formed this network on it. And what we do is that we look at the e-petition cases, <clears throat> whereas before um, we had this national petition system um, as a result of the Sunflower Movement uh, by the end of 2014. 
It is a demand of the national forum um, of citizens, which was held because of the Sunflower Movement, that the government must not repeat its mistake, uh, which was to open the cross-strait uh, service trade agreement to public um, consultation very late in the process, uh, where people are left with only the right of, I don't know, bike shedding. Um, so <laughs> the idea is that for, for all the regulations and all the laws, um, there must be a ongoing system for people to have meaningful conversations. And when the agenda setting power um, is was monopolized by the government, people really want a we the people uh, like petition system uh, where 5,000 citizens together <clears throat> can demand a response uh, from the administration. But unlike uh, We the People, um, many people proposed cross-ministerial issues, uh, and it wasn't really clear uh, whether which minister or which officer uh, would be in charge of responding to those e-petitions. So what we observed was that um, the single ministry issues um, get really meaningful to a dialogue with ministries, especially uh, the already public-facing ministries, such as the health and welfare. But all the pretty much all the cross ministry issues uh, just get an explanation uh, rather than a, a real solution, a real dialogue for that matter. And, and the reason why is that the ministry people is very siloed. They are not used to work with or across uh, ministry boundary lines. And so as a minister with a portfolio and therefore not partial to any ministry, um, the idea is that I, I lead this um, peer network in a um, service um, service-based leadership kind of way, in the sense that I, I don't command them uh, to do anything. But if they need a facilitator, we provide a facilitator. If they need co-design workshop, we hold a co-design workshop. Uh, if they need ways to handhold them to talk with angry stakeholders, so we, we do that too. Um, and so the idea is that we lower their fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And so on a typical Friday, uh, we will meet in the social innovation lab uh, in Taipei, we meet um, roughly twice a month, sometimes three times a month, um, to do a uh, mind map together um, with the stakeholders who, who did the petitions. So uh, as a concrete example, um, for example, people petitioned that there's now random scams on Facebook that propose to sell some goods at a really cheap price, but when they order and pay, pay on arrival, and so when they pay for, say, a hard disk, and when they arrive to, to their doors, um, they found that it's actually counterfeit goods, or really it's a brick, uh, but they have already paid, and the uh, delivery people have already gone, and the sender is you know, a anonymous or a non-existing entity, and when they came to the ever so helpful uh, instant message uh, assistant of that Facebook page, they discover it is actually a robot. So, um, so there, there is, uh, it is actually a, a legitimate concern, and, and there's widespread scams uh, on Facebook uh, last year, and so more than 5,000 people petitioned uh, so that the government can look into it and, and do something. Uh, but, you know, just like the problem of, of email spam, uh, the solution doesn't really lie in any single ministry, nor does it lie in any sector for that matter. Uh, we, we need to all do a little bit in every point possible and solve the issues collaboratively um, So to increase the cost of scam scammers, uh, essentially. So what we did is um, we meet in this social innovation lab uh, with the, not just the petitioners, we invite up to five uh, co-petitioners um, to Taipei face-to-face, -face, but we also live stream it if they want, and also invite the stakeholders such as um, the e-commerce uh, association, the delivery companies, and, um, and and so on, and try to figure out where exactly uh, in this uh, problem map uh, are we. And so we, we come up together with this um, mind map of where exactly is the problem and how do we respond to it uh, creatively. Now, this is going to be all like Chinese characters for you, but I'm going to share my screens anyway because it's okay. kind of difficult to, to paint this picture without a picture. Um, just a second. Um, how do I even share my screen? Um, I'm sure that here, here we go. Um, can you see my screen now? 
Yes. Okay, it's coming yes, through. Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. So, as we can see, the primary responsible ministries uh, are the Consumer Protection Agency, the Ministry of Transportation and Communication, and the Ministry of Finance. Um, and then, um, in a assisting. Uh, capacities, the Ministry of Economy, uh, Fair Trade Commission, and our Ministry of Interior, because they are the police people, and also the Central Bank, because, well, they're interested, uh, and um, the e-commerce associations, the home delivery guys, and um, the, you know, petitioners and um, co-countersign people. So what we did is that we used this um, design thinking uh, method to um, ask people to write in post-it notes uh, colored as um, problems uh, or challenges uh, and the blue ones are the facts, right? And then the red uh, ones are the, the feelings, the, the negative mostly, the restrictions and the ideas are colored in green and um, the responses from the government are colored in orange. And so um, we dissect the entire uh, from the, the touch points, the, the, the journey of people um, getting into a scam into, uh, and then receiving and then not able to get a refund into very small steps and then um, get to assign uh, responsible ministries for each very small part of it. And afterwards, um, we started this problem statement uh, about how to educate the people and how to make those kind of skin more expensive and co-created um, the solutions. So the idea is that people who complain the loudest are our co-creators um, and they, they kind of earn the right um, by starting a, a useful petition. And we can also assign some cards to external stakeholders, such as um, how to educate users to identify those scams and how to um, um, associate this report uh, scam uh, mechanism with other validation mechanisms, such as the, the gray tick on Facebook. And those two post-it notes we assign to Facebook because that's something only they can do. Uh, and so uh, when I visited Facebook, uh, I just you know bring out this context, saying all the other stakeholders are already committed to be part of the, the solution so so why don't you know you show some corporate responsibility uh, to a society and and to their credit they after just a couple of weeks uh, joined locally um, the Taiwan e-commerce association and started a face-to-face -face dialogue and forum uh, with the people impacted and try to co-create a solution together so so it's a I think this kind of structured conversation, if it's just once every year or so, um, it will be seen as a experiment. But now, because we do it um, literally like 20 or 30 times a year, um, it becomes uh, a part of the norm. Um, the ministries all think that, okay, it's just the way you deal with petitioners. But actually, this methodology can also be scaled to deal with pretty much everything uh, that needs to work across silos. So we use the public pressure from the petitioners and the known weak point, um, that is to say the inability to handle cross-ministry issues and, tr and organize or coordinate the ministries so that they can self-organize and um, meet the stakeholders and turn those noises, uh, you know, those um, statements that people post on the petition platform uh, and group them into signals, that is to say the aspects that are um, constructive on this uh, mind map. So they're now all pretty well versed uh, in this methodology. We have run like 27 uh, co-creation workshops. Can I ask you, how do you ensure the participation of uh, kind of a wide range of people? Because obviously it's quite appealing to young people. Um, do you have quite a wide range of age uh, in terms of... So, um, I, I think participation is, is such a, a wide word. Um, so, we, we deal with um, local issues as well. There is one case where we deal with um, the Hongchun, which is the southmost part of Taiwan, uh, and they the people there were petitioning for a for a helicopter uh, to be stationed, the police helicopter, the Blackhawks, to be stationed in their local little-use airport 
because they are too far away from the close by large hospital who is able to treat cardiac arrest and things like that. And and it's a popular diving place. And so they want helicopters to essentially serve as ambulance cars um, because the closest large hospital is like 90 minutes away. And so um, they, they employ many tactics and, and it's definitely not just young people because the Hengchun doesn't have even the population for the petition, but it's a very uh, popular touristy attraction. So they organize booth and um, there's uh, bed and breakfast that, you know, um, scares their customers saying, you know, what will happen if you get a heart attack here? You better go online and sign this petition before checking in. Uh, and there's all sort of community organization methods um, that I did uh, to, to push the, the uh, conversation on a national agenda. And, and I'm um, very grateful that the Ministry of Health Care and Welfare, as well as the interior and the, the transportation, we explore literally all the possible solutions to this problem. And we finally settled on um, assigning a huge sum to build a, um, a large uh, medical center uh, in that place, um, and which is actually the, the, the really the solution that solves the root cause, because otherwise the doctors will just be leave this place uh, even more because the uh, real hard cases are helicoptered away. And anyway, but the idea is that uh, we, we went there. So we, we all went there for uh, all the different ministries and uh, participation offices, the, the team and the PD's team um, and, and so on. And we all went to the southwest part of Taiwan to have a face-to-face -face town hall style discussion. And, and so the idea is that we still have this co-creation workshop of around 30 people in one room, but also in the same building, in the town hall, uh, we broadcast this entire conversation in real time. And uh, I personally serve as the, the anchor, uh, like the ESPN anchor, to, to explain to the townspeople uh, why this expert is saying this, why is this PowerPoint slide important. So, so the people in the first room can still dialogue in a somewhat more efficient way using expert language and, and so on, while uh, people in the second room can always dial in uh, using um, what we call Slido, um, a, a online um, opinion collection system. I go over every single Slido um, comments that's uh, being liked um, in, the, in the order of likes, uh, and so to feedback uh, the crowdsourced wisdom from the general population. Uh, I think the average age is over 40 uh, uh, on the, on the uh, town hall and, and to, to feedback those into the uh, real-time deliberation that's happening in a smaller room, uh, which is um, uh, co coordinated and facilitated by the third-party neutral uh, facilitator. And, and so we, well, we think the idea is not, not about just one phase of um, one part of the deliberation that's online. I think online is just uh, agenda setting. Uh, it's a signal that says this is important, you need to look into it. Uh, but afterwards, it's ethnographic research, it is face-to-face, um, -face, small groups, focus groups. But the idea is that we do it in a transparent way so that any meeting uh, can refer to the product of the early synthesis of the meetings. And whenever we have a binding consultation, we always meet face-to-face, -face, but also try to get people who would not otherwise be able to participate to, to participate through 360 uh, real real time live stream or virtual reality even and, and, and things like that. So so it's an equalizer. It's not meant to replace face to face meeting, which would of course result of more young people than um, other age groups, but rather a uh, town hall meeting that is people of all the age groups, but also augmented uh, with online participation. Uh, and I think that kind of balances uh, the local wisdom versus the um, technical or scientific knowledge uh, of the people who are online. So what are your aims for the future? Um, your Twitter profile, you decide you <coughs> define yourself. Uh, could you explain that to me and, and tell me what your aims are? Sorry, my Twitter what? On your Twitter profile, uh -huh. you describe yourself as an anarchist. A, a conservative anarchist, yes. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, um, a, a 
Well, you, wh which part do you want to hear? <laughs> Both parts, <laughs> I assume. <laughs> right. Um, right. So, um, an anarchist um, is, uh, well, to me at least, uh, someone who does not give commands, uh, who, who don't coerce other people into doing things, right? And also, of course, equally important, someone who doesn't take commands. Uh, and, and all the transactions and relationships need to be voluntary uh, from all parties. Uh, that's what anarchists uh, mean to me. Um, and, and because of this, it means that the bureaucratic organizations, such as countries, or um, implicit command structures, such as nations, um, these are useful illusions, um, but they are not always useful. And so we, we still use it as a abstraction when they fit, but uh, we don't use it when it's a uh, leaky abstraction, meaning that they, they don't fit. And so we try not to pay too much attention to any uh, hierarchical organizational structure. Uh, right. But the uh, conservative part kind of balances this out. Um, conservative to me means that to respect the, the traditions, respect the, the way people's lives are. There's a lot of existing ways um, of cultures, both the internet culture as well as the the face-to-face -face, um, culture uh, that are worth keeping. And as those two cultures, or many cultures for that matter, <clears throat> are kind of just mishmashing uh, into each other, I think what, what is important to me about conservation or conservative is to keep what works and not to try to install too drastic a change um, in circumstances or simply declare that one culture is good and the other is obsolete and need to be uh, obliterated uh, and, and so on. So um, I think the, the two words linked together, conservative and anarchist, to me personally, means to, to keep what always has worked uh, in the internet culture as well as in the, the larger civilization and try to fuse them gradually uh, with the society without sacrificing um, any one side of things or, or what uh, people value. Okay, that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. So what are your aims as digital minister? What are you going to be doing going forward? Well, I'm always doing the same things. Um, whether or not people call me digital minister or not. Uh, so so, it, it, so uh, I'm not really doing anything as the digital minister. I remember the, the first interview with the uh, premier, Ling Quan, uh, the previous premier, who, who uh, asked me whether I want to join the cabinet. Um, and I, I just draw him this, this mind map of all the work that I've been doing, all my projects. Uh, and he looked at it. Edit. And I'm like, is there anything I can't do uh, in this that because of you know my role in the cabinet? And then he looked at it and, and says, no, you just keep on doing whatever you're already doing. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, right. So, so the digital minister uh, to me is a more of an honorary title uh, <laughs> that that really doesn't <laughs> stop it. And and because I don't take commands either, right? So so I don't get assignments uh, as such. So. Um, yeah, so, so the, the work that I'm always doing, uh, regardless of whether digital minister or not, um, is just to um, scale the, the experience of um, listening uh, and, and be listened to. Um, so, so see, when, when two people are meeting face to face and um, they attune to each other's um, emotion and mental state and so on, um, they, they engage in this very, um, you know, the individualities melt away and people get genuine creativity and so on. They're listening like that as magic. Um, but we, we do face a lot of space and time um, constraints. Um, which is why we need a noise cancelling headphone uh, to talk to you. Which <laughs> is why uh, we need Skype, uh, right? Because we're in different time zones um, and, and so on. So, so I mean, there's parts where technologies can help, but, but it, it's not to make us superhuman. It's just to to um, restore to a, a more a better human condition. Uh, that that's that's the kind of where we started, right? Um, and, and the same goes to to the number of people um, because of is uh, wet way uh, restrictions. <laughs> we, we can't really um, have a conversation with more than 
a hundred people or so, uh, and keeping track in our head uh, everybody's mental and emotional state. It, it's just not possible. The, the best facilitators can do maybe a hundred people, but but not more than that. Um, but but the and of course people can separate into groups, but then you get hierarchies. Hierarchies just kind of grow out of this. Um, um, Inherent limitation, and and worse, um, the group dynamics uh, kind of just mandates that there will emerge um, either a, a leader or a leading um, thought uh, ideology or, or kind of a uh, a, a, a duo um, at play that people other people kind of just give up their um, creativity uh, as time goes goes on, uh, and this is a very well studied. Um, issue uh, until internet came along and and then suddenly people who share the same affinity to a keyword just started trusting each other in a very quick way uh, and then it become it scaled out but but it, it's not scaled deeply nor has it really scaled up the number of people it, all it did is, is scale out this kind of uh, shallow not quite listening listening and and so um, my, my work has always been to, to go into all the three dimensions, um, to scale out, to scale up, and to scale deeply, uh, and try to get the same listening experience, but instead of, you know, like radio and television, where one person gets to speak to one million people, but have no idea what those million people said, um, try to listen to those millions of people as signal, but not as noise. Uh, but. Uh, Equally importantly, to, to have millions of people listen to each other uh, and to partake in this kind of uh, listening experience. So, yeah, it, it's been always the project that I don't think uh, it's my project. <laughs> I think it is just um, how the technologies uh, evolved in a asymmetrical way at the beginning. And with the internet, there was this huge dream the Clue Train Manifesto and Declaration of Service Space Independence and all that, uh, and to, to kind of um, democratize this. But it didn't quite play out that way, right? So we talk about um, re-decentralization. We talk, talk about uh, re -de -re -de centralization uh, And, and some, somehow, I think, um, artificial intelligence um, will um, either just make the facilitation so so easy, so that uh, we we don't feel that it's a uh, hundred people will be able to listen to one hundred people as if it's one person, or it will uh, it will fake that, right? So so basically just echo chambering and and listen to the part in the one hundred people where we already uh, identify with, which doesn't really uh, mean anything. Right? So so there's there's potentials uh, in in many different ways, and I'm just trying to um, to to build some authenticity uh, in in this uh, process and to be with the public service because they of all people are tasked with listening right to the general public and um, if if anything um, I think the real innovations will will happen with people who are who have the career uh, of listen to um, just random stakeholders just because they're as assets. Great. So, so you mentioned AI as one of the technologies that you think is going to be helpful in kind of collating these large amounts of information and opinions. Mm -hmm. Is there any other technology? And, and, and are you talking about the uh, Polis platform? Is that that's an AI-enabled platform, isn't it? Yeah. Well, well, it's. I mean, AI means anything now, right? It just mostly <laughs> yeah. means automation now. So, so in, in that sense, in that sense, it's an AI-powered <laughs> conversation for sure. <laughs> um, it, it uses, um, you know, um, I, I think it's it, it's like the, the ELISA of, uh, of, of scalable um, conversation. It's, it's very easy to explain. Um, just like Eliza, if you have seen the script of Eliza, you know immediately how it's like. It matches some keyword and, and it's just a chatbot. Um, but um, just like Polis, um, if you uh, see how um, it used the k-means clustering to cluster the votes and the principal component analysis to determine the most controversial dimensions, that's pretty much it. Um, there's no deep learning or anything AI. Um, Traditional AI machine learning uh, involved, but, but that's the, the that's the beauty of it. Um, just, just like um, the the recent, um, there there was this 
this bot, uh, a chatbot with a face that was um, named a, a citizen of a, uh, a Saudi Arabian country or something uh, from Hanson Robotics. Um, yeah, uh, the, the beauty of that is that a chatbot with a face is actually in many cases working better than than real uh, artificial intelligent uh, robotic assistants um, because people uh, people want to hear other people they, they the chatbot is just a, a conduit uh, to for like a better term um, and so yeah you can think police as AI but, but it's really just a chatbot with a face um, that, that shows you the face of, of the crowd in the, the most um, cognitively pleasing way uh, and and so yeah I, I would like broadly speaking, I think it's AI, um, but but I think it's um, as as things go by, we I think of AI as as just outsourcing um, the cognitive functions, um, the predictable parts of cognitive functions that a facilitator goes through as she is facilitating uh, a room. Uh, for example, she would need to hear the, the sounds and uh, identify which part in the mind map that I just showed you is this person talking about. And that re requires um, semantic analysis or, and well, and, and very simple things, just, you know, speech recognition and gaze recognition, right? And when many people are talking together, they need to figure out the, the, the attention, uh, like the gaze uh, of um, the various participants around and then to handle the group dynamic. And, and of course, just like most of the cognitive functions, those are automatic and uh, Part of facilitator training, just like driving a car, is to spot those cues and, and respond um, accordingly. And, and just like self-driving cars, these are people what people do subconsciously. And so these are actually what machine learning can help. And they can help in a way that doesn't make value judgments, but rather just take the, the mind, let the facilitator take the mind off because it's augmenting uh, the, the human capacity and so that the facilitator can concentrate uh, on, on understanding and, and getting to the consensus that people can live with. And so I, I see AI in a more, um, there's a term for it, it's called calm technology, um, in, in a way that, that that's the that's the, the inverse, that's the reverse of distract, distractive technologies. Like it, it gives you more, attention. Um, it, it doesn't take your attention away. Uh, and so most of the uh, research and experiment that we're doing now, um, such as the, the 360 um, um, camera that's linked with system that automatically transcribe what everybody says and who is speaking and who is paying attention to where and so on, uh, are, the, are the things that are there so that people are just vaguely aware of it. It's the environment as a computer and, and it makes people suddenly feel that they could focus on each other more. And, and this is the kind of AI that I'm referring to. And POTUS or Slido and, and so on, the real-time map are, of course, part of it. Very interesting. Okay, so uh, are there any other plans uh, in terms of what you're doing in v for the future? Are you going to be expanding out to beyond uh, digital policy making? Well, you, you see, the, the, the e-petition platform, uh, the join platform, um, J O I N um, is 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 it's not particularly digital, right? We we, we talk about the deployment of helicopters or not <laughs> in Hunchun. We talk about um, uh, whether we need to ban fishing in our first uh, open to the public national marine park. Uh, we talk about whether single women should be able to get a child uh, by her own volition, uh, and, and so. It, there's nothing digital in, in those topics. Uh, and, and so the, 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 the production system, I think of Join uh, platform as our production system, um, on, on top of it um, is all of the laws, all of the regulations announced 60 days um, before taking effect or sending to the parliament. On top of it is uh, every ministry's budget and all the KPIs and, and how each government procurement or uh, spending is going toward uh, those government projects. There's this nifty visual budget, uh, visualization of the national budget. And of course, there's the e-petition part. Um, and so the production platform has long since moved beyond the, the digital issues. Uh, and um, in fact, we, we meet 
every week or every other week um, to to tackle those those issues. Um, the Vita One platform um, remains experimental, and um, the government isn't even at arm's length. <laughs> uh, we are we're, we're totally giving up control um, on Vita One. Just as Minister Jacqueline Tsai totally gave up control when she went to the Gap Zero hackathon and, and say the government doesn't know how to do this, you, you guys figure it out. Um, and so in, in her tradition, uh, I, I, now that I'm the additional minister, I'm explicitly not telling the Vitalian folks uh, how to deliberate any particular topic. Uh, all I um, promise is that any topics that's chosen collaboratively by the National Development Council and the Vitalian community, I will give it binding power by personally <coughs> attending the consultation meetings, by bringing a synthetic documents to the premier, by um, you know making it part of our digital agenda and things like that. But other than providing buying power and a, the, the very nice social innovation lab to have weekly meetups. I, I'm not really directing anyone uh, to, to do anything um, on any topic. But but this is a luxury, you see, um, for, for things like um, whether we build a, a building or not, whether we ban fishing or not, it's not very clear that we can find uh, win-win solutions. Um, there's there's going to be trade-offs. There's going to be parts of it that are zero-sum. We, we try very hard uh, with co-creation to find win-win solutions, but sometimes we find just solutions that people can barely live with, and, and that's that's politics. But, but with, with, with digital um, issues, nobody really knows how it's going to be. Uh, and uh, there's there's no zero sum. Generally speaking, there's no zero sum because there was not a status quo. Um, there was no no Uber before Uber was introduced, right? So so um, it is almost always possible with digital um, to to find a way that is based on the abundant mindset rather than the scarcity mindset. And so we we handpick, curate those topics and, and, and give the Vitaiwan people uh, the community for rain because you know the worst they can do is to, to come up with the zero solution, meaning that we don't do anything, which is okay with digital matters. <laughs> right? um, but more often than not, they come up with really creative uh, solutions and, and reach a lot of stakeholders. And also with digital issues, um, we can engage the uh, international um, network community because as we're deliberating about Uber or Airbnb or platform economy, everybody else is doing the same thing. Uh, and so we, we get to think outside of a national or city boundary and, and to really uh, do it in a way that's sustainable uh, to all the uh, stakeholders involved, which is why internet participation is very important. But it is very difficult to imagine for a local, whether we build a hospital or not, discussion that we will get a fraction of the international um, interest uh, on these kind of matters. And, and so scaling out is kind of, you know, down to us political deliberations of either one just doesn't really make any sense, any sense. and it will necessarily um, make this, you know, anarchistic, uh, leaderless community um, s split because um, there will be uh, people who are more familiar with the local issue or there will be people who think of it as a zero-sum game. But uh, digital issues that we put on V-Taiwan um, don't suffer from these issues. So, so I think we have one for the for, for foreseeable future, I think, uh, we remain to tackle issues uh, related to to the digital world, just because it's um, not zero sum. Uh, but if we somehow, you know, um, you know, with, I don't know, co-fusion or things like that, a uh, um, matter duplicator or things like that, uh, to, to make real world stuff uh, also no zero sum, then, then of course we can open up more room for experimentation. But before that, uh, we defer to the internal V-Taiwan-like network, uh, which is the PO network, and they are all career public servants trained to tackle this kind of issue. I still also give them free reign. But at least their peers are all participation officers and career public servants and uh, authorized by their deputy minister or CIO to make hard decisions if needed be. And so there's two communities uh, and for the joint um, platform uh, we use the internal 
community and for digital issues, uh, we engage the, the retail and of zero community. Your approach is quite unique across the world mm -hmm. if you look at other democracies. Mm -hmm. Do you see it working where else, or is it very unique to you? Well, uh, we, we actually learned a lot, I mean, uh, from other places. Um, the joint platform in particular, the e-petition platform, while inspired by We The People, uh, is actually modeled largely after the, um, the, the Iceland, I, I can't pronounce their capital, I'm sorry, the, the better Reykjavik, whatever, uh, platform. Um, the, the idea is that the, the, at city level, uh, we learned from the Madrid city, the council platform, the Barcelona city. Um, there's, there's actually many cities, the Paris city, for their participatory budgeting platform. Um, and of course, uh, many nearby city states as well, the Singapore government digital service and, and things like that. So you, you see a lot of this kind of co-creation in um, community level, like in the UK or in city level in some younger democracies. Um, well, so I, I don't think we're that unique. What, what's perhaps unique uh, is that we're scaling it to 23 million people. So, so it's the population, I think, that is the main uh, unique point. Otherwise, if you just look at half a million people cities, there's plenty of them doing similar uh, innovations. Um, but I think the geography of Taiwan is, is particular in this regard because um, with the, the Taiwan high-speed rails going from the northmost to the southmost uh, station, um, it's just two hours, a little bit more than two hours. So, so it is a, a city, right, <laughs> by, by, by many measurements. And of course, it's mostly a single island. Uh, and so we're very easy to get the 4G coverage or the internet um, penetration to, to one of the world's highest. And, and even when moving like hundreds of miles per hour uh, on the Taiwan high-speed rail, we were able to um, give free Wi-Fi access, uh, even in the tunnels. And so in, in many ways, the, the geography is in our favor because it, it's, we, we don't have that much of a digital gap. Uh, and of the, um, the remaining like 3% of uh, areas, uh, the population who don't, uh, can't afford usually if they're in uh, indigenous or are really rural like uh, remote island um, places, we, because the president's high, believes in, in broadband as human right, uh, we use special budget uh, to, to you know, fill all those remaining two or three percent. So, so there's no excuse of saying we can't get a 10 megabit uplink. Um, and and when, when you get there, then, then a lot of things just became a lot more possible. Um, and um, also because Taiwan is uh, constitutionally protecting the education budget um, and the education reform now also emphasizes autonomy, learning, co-learning with the teacher from the internet and things like that as part of the new curriculum. Um, the, the entire generation of kids are, are, are raised uh, to have the skill of critical thinking and uh, debating both face-to-face uh, -face and online. And actually, to them, there's a really no difference uh, between those two worlds anymore. And so with this kind of population, um, we can then treat 23 million more of like a 23,000 uh, people's city, geographically speaking, and so focus on getting the best ideas, but not focusing so much on, uh, you know, just getting the last mile fibers um, or other things like that. So uh, the education uh, level, the uh, young democracy engagement level, and the geography, I think, all work in our favor. Thank you. That's really interesting. And thank you for explaining everything so clearly. Precisely, I appreciate that. Um, was there anything more to add at all? I think we've covered all the questions. I don't know if you thought there was anything that might be missing that might be interesting for our readers. Hmm. Well, um, let's see. Um, well, I, I kind of elided a question. That, that's how did the Vitaven story play out of that, right? We, we didn't really go over that one. Um, but, uh, but, but you're, you're interviewing everybody else in the Vitaven community, right? They're actually starting a, a hackpad to collaboratively answer that. So, so I'll just give my side of the story then. Um, the, the, the Vitaven story from, from my 
point of view. Um, it, it, it's a story of the central government having lost all legitimacy, uh, and the occupiers and occupied sympathizers won the local election, um, threatening to make the central government irrelevant. That I think that's the the, the background, the backstory of the story. If you will. Um, it's also the story of a existing civic tech community, the the Gov Zero community, um, with the slogan "Fork the government." Um, kind of, we we really didn't want to fork the entire government. Um, people kind of just picked the the part of government where we had the most gripe with, and forked that particular part of it. Uh, but but when the central government having lost all legitimacy, and they came asking, how about forking the entire central government? Um, it, it's it's yeah. W w without that domain name G zero P dot T W, I, I don't think we will rise up to the task. Um, it, it's subconscious. I, I would think that um, people, after living with this domain name G zero B dot T W for three years now, uh, at the time of uh, when Jacqueline Side came to the Gov Zero Hackathon, um, people were like, "We, we, we thought maybe one thousandth of the government," and you're like, "You're handing the entire uh, national government's." Um, Working staff to to us. Like, what are we going to do with that? Um, and and so um, I think it's subliminally in in all of our heads. Yeah, when Jacqueline asked something, and we did our research, uh, we checked uh, similar efforts across the world, and none of them really went anywhere. If it's national scale, um, the closest we could find is the Cornell University's regulation room, and again they pick things that they they think are very fit for this kind of online format. And even though they had a lot of problems with getting the message uh, scaling out, they were able to to scale up and deeply, but not really scaling out a lot. So, um, to to our knowledge, at that time, at the end of 2014. There's no project that addresses all the three dimensions simultaneously and succeeded in any way, and and so um, we kind of very clearly told Jacqueline that what she's asking is impossible, uh, but we, we we're going to try it anyway, um, and so um, and and I think it is to the Gov Zero community's credit that um, nobody feel that we need to do it right. People just started to to do it every single which way uh, and and <clears throat> because we think forks are good so we we forked ourselves even the community at that point <laughs> forked into many different approaches uh, to try to tackle this this impossible problem uh, and only very recently do we see a little bit of merging back and <clears throat> it would be a problem uh, if uh, it started as an organization, we would say the organization has fragmented to seven different factions. Uh, but, but because it's leaderless to begin with, so for us it's just you know seven projects that all work in the open on GitHub and and on Trello and on Slack and and people can. Uh, some people don't. <coughs> Has a philosophical stance against Slack. So some faction uh, worked exclusively on IRC and some on Telegram, uh, and so we had to build those robot bridges to bring those channels together, so people can use the the vehicles that and channels they identify with, and, and so on. So so we did a lot of those cultural hacks, um, and and in the in the meantime, reached people who had something to contribute to. To this network, but did not at all speak the language of technology, and I think without those uh, people, um, we, we wouldn't go anywhere really. And so I, I think after being asked of doing the impossible, the GovZero community just dispersed uh, in, into all the different corners, and and because of the Occupy, there's this implicit trust between the, the 20 or so NGOs and the Gov Zero people who supported their, getting their message across. So, so we were not seen as random strangers. We were the comrades, in, in some sense, uh, who worked just a couple months ago, right? So um, then we started building connections and 
bringing those uh, people in. And so, so yeah, it is a, a scaling out and then in and then deeply of the God Zero community itself. Um, and I am just one very small fragment <laughs> of it. Um, and uh, just like with all the large open source or free software projects, um, you know, um, Linus told us one uh, is like to, to joke that he just, you know, focus on being lazy and taking all the credit. Uh, and and uh, I'm more or less in the same boat, <laughs> which is why I, I try to get um, Shu Yang or, or Avros or Guan Yu or, or other people uh, to go now to uh, international conferences and speak and so on, because it is as much their work as, as anybody's. And I, I don't really want us, uh, the first generationals in the VTOWN project, to dominate the discourse. It wasn't fair. And also, the digital issues we're facing now in 2018 is radically different from digital issues we were facing in 2014. It, it's just very different. And so um, it, it needs new approaches and needs new ways of thinking. And uh, the least I can do is try not to be in the way. Uh, and, and so that's that's my, my part of the story. Great. Well, thank you so much for talking to me today. It was really good to meet you. Mm -hmm. really appreciate the time. Right. And we did end up taking more than an hour. So, we did? Yeah. <laughs> One hour and seven minutes. So All right, that was then. good. So I'll okay. send you the, the high-quality recording then. Oh, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Have a good flight mm -hmm. and a good time in New Zealand. All right. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Bye.